an invasion to end a rebellion. 48,000 United States soldiers, commanded by Major General Ulysses S. Grant, disembark at Pittsburgh Landing in southwest Tennessee. The Union High Command believes a crippling blow in the heart of the Confederacy will bring the war to a swift conclusion. Almost overnight, U.S. Grant has become a national hero, a man hailed in the press as unconditional surrender Grant. In February, Grant's bold offensive against Fort Henry and Fort Donelson gave the North its first major victories of the war forcing the unconditional surrender of an entire Confederate army. The fall of the two forts and capture of nearly 16,000 prisoners of war enables Union forces to seize control of the Lower Tennessee River, a strategic pathway to invade the Confederate heartland. After this stunning defeat, Confederate forces in the West abandon Kentucky and Middle Tennessee, retiring south into West Tennessee northern Alabama and Mississippi. To transport Grant's forces, the Federals lease a fleet of steamboats. Throughout March 1862, over 12 dozen vessels steam southward with men, munitions, food, tents, and supplies. Everything Grant needs to wage war. A journey requiring weeks overland now takes only days on the Tennessee. The Union forces unload at Pittsburgh Landing, where roads provide easy access to rail lines crucial to the Confederate war effort. By early April, Grant's growing tent city stretches across a high wooded plateau from the Tennessee River to the swampy Owl Creek bottoms. Grant's most inexperienced troops camp over two miles from the landing in woods and fields surrounding a log Methodist meeting house named Shiloh. Like most Union soldiers, Leander Stilwell of the 61st Illinois Infantry is happy to be off a crowded steamboat and onto dry land, even if it is enemy territory. We had just left the bleak, frozen north, where all was cold and cheerless, and we found ourselves in a clime where the air was soft and warm as it was in Illinois in the latter part of May. The green grass was springing from the ground. The trees were bursting into leaf, and the woods were full of feathered songsters. Grant's mission sever two vital western confederate railroads which intersect at the small town of corinth mississippi the memphis and charleston is the south's only complete rail connection linking the mississippi to the atlantic for the union to regain possession of the lower mississippi river and split the confederacy in two control of these railroads is vitally important their capture would cut confederate supply lines and severely weaken the South's ability to defend and hold the valley. Grant knows a large enemy force is gathered to defend the Corinth Railroad Junction. But he is unaware those same Confederates are now marching forward to attack him. General Albert Sidney Johnston commands the Western Confederate Army. Confederate President Jefferson Davis boasts, if Johnston is not a general, then we have no general. A West Point graduate, Johnston has a bold plan to destroy Grant's army, surprise and turn Grant's left flank, cut off his line of retreat to the Tennessee River, pin his army against the swampy lowlands of Owl Creek, force Grant to surrender. The Confederate advance towards Shiloh is troubled from the start. A spring storm turns crude roads into rivers of mud. A 
march which should have taken a single day to accomplish consumes three. For Johnston, it is a race against the clock. He has received intelligence that more Union troops will soon be joining Grant at Pittsburgh Landing. Marching overland from Nashville is a second Union Army. 35,000 soldiers under the command of General Don Carlos Buell. After occupying Pittsburgh Landing, Grant receives explicit orders from his commander in St. Louis. Keep your forces together until you connect with General Buell. Don't let the enemy draw you into an engagement now. For his bold gamble to succeed, Johnston must strike before Buell joins forces with Grant. 16-year-old Thomas Duncan from Mississippi is a courier for the Confederates. Riding out to a high point in front of our center, I hear the Union troops drilling in their encampment. The drum and fife and the commands of the officers are plainly heard. It suddenly struck me. The Union Army is absolutely unaware of the presence of our army. Brigadier General William Tecumseh Sherman is agitated by reports of large groups of Confederates. What the hell is this guy? For days, Federal troops have clashed with what Union soldiers believe are Confederate patrols. Both Sherman and Grant are convinced Johnston lacks the resolve and ability to mount an offensive. Grant and his generals have no idea the leading edge of Johnston's army lies barely a mile beyond forward Union lines. When you said it, when you pray, say our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in on earth. Most of the Confederate soldiers are like Thomas Duncan. Our sins. Raw recruits who have never tasted battle. As night came on, we lay down in line of battle to rest and slumber, realizing the danger of the coming morn and the certainty that for many, the next sunrise would be their last on earth. Everett Peabody commands a brigade on the Union front line. Unlike his superiors, Peabody believes the Confederate presence is more than scouting parties. Despite standing orders to not engage the enemy, Peabody orders 250 men out on a pre-dawn patrol. Around 5 a.m., the patrol is fired upon by Confederate pickets. In pursuit, they step onto the farm of James Fraley, some three miles southwest of Pittsburgh Landing. must conquer or perish. 
Henry Morton Stanley is an Irish immigrant serving in the 6th Arkansas Infantry. As we tramped through the thin forest, I noticed the woods would have been a grand place for a picnic, and I thought it strange that a Sunday should have been chosen to disturb the holy calm of this place. Peabody's superior is General Benjamin Prentice. Colonel Peabody, report! Sir, all indications are that there's a sizable force of Confederates that are coming up from the Boria. Prentice accuses the young colonel of violating orders and bringing on the engagement. I didn't bring on an engagement. The whole Confederate army's marching on me, sir! Prentice's heavily outnumbered division puts up stubborn resistance. But by 9 a.m., their defense crumbles. Killed while trying to rally his troops is Colonel Everett Peabody. Half of Grant's soldiers have never been in combat, including 18-year-old Leander Stilwell. I was astonished at our first retreat in the morning. It seemed to me we were forever disgraced. I kept thinking to myself, what will they say about this at home? Instead of advancing, many Confederates break ranks to ransack Prentice's camps. Many have not eaten since leaving Corinth three days earlier. Johnston is infuriated when he catches an officer plundering. But then he sees it as an opportunity to rally his men. In four hours of fighting, Grant's army suffers over 2,000 casualties. Most soldiers engaged at Shiloh are between 18 and 30 years old. 16-year-old musician John Cockrell is an exception. Cockrell arrived with his father, the commander of the 70th Ohio Infantry. But early in the confusion, John and his father become separated near Shiloh Church. soon finds himself aiding the wounded. Near Shiloh Church, passing soldiers called for me to assist them. We carried the poor fellow to the rear and found there a scene of disorder, not to say panic. The enemy began pressing closely, and Shiloh Church was no more a desirable place for my military observations. I started towards the Tennessee River. I had not proceeded more than a mile when I encountered General John MacArthur's Highland Brigade of Illinois troops. A chipper young lieutenant stopped me and asked where did I belong. I replied that I belonged to Ohio. He said that Ohio was making a bad show of it, then asked if I wanted to fight with them. I responded I was willing to take a temporary berth in his regiment. Thus, I became attached to Company B of the 9th Illinois Regiment. Johnston's offensive has forced the Federals out of their forward camps. Fresh Union divisions moving to the front stem this initial setback. 
Johnston personally supervises the Confederate right, while General P.G.T. Beauregard oversees the left. By 11 a.m., the battle rages along a crooked three-mile front. Six hours into battle, the Confederate offensive slowly begins to unravel. Communication is breaking down. Exhausted troops are becoming separated from their units. Senior officers find themselves commanding total strangers. The heavy forest and deep ravines only add to the confusion. Most serious is the awful carnage. At Ray Field, the 6th Mississippi launches the first assault on Sherman's camps. They march straight into a murderous crossfire of Union musketry and artillery. In mere moments, 300 of the 425 Mississippians are cut down. Their ranks shattered, the survivors retreat over their own dead and dying. The unprecedented slaughter of the 6th Mississippi stuns the Confederates. It is the first of many such scenes repeated again and again at Shiloh. For Grant, the attack is a complete surprise, but he remains calm, encouraging his generals to maintain their positions. After overrunning Prentice's camps, Johnston believes he has turned Grant's left flank. In reality, he has struck Grant center and right. Unaware of his error, Johnston continues to overcommit his forces to the western half of the battlefield. The critical decision leaves only five of his 16 brigades engaged on the right. At noon, Grant's troops counterattack. Hastily reorganized divisions led by John McClernand and William Tecumseh Sherman assault the Confederates on the Union right. The charge rolls south one half mile where it collides with stubborn resistance and grinds to a halt. We held this position for three long hours, sometimes gaining and at other times losing ground. General McClernand and myself, acting in perfect concert, struggling to maintain this line. After some of the most severe fighting at Shiloh, Sherman and McClernand grudgingly give ground, but their decimated divisions have bought Grant what he needs most, precious time. For another hour, Sherman and McClernand defend a new line west of rugged Tillman Branch. Meanwhile, on the other side of the battlefield, Johnston attacks Union forces in the steep terrain overlooking the Tennessee River. There, among the ranks of the 9th Illinois, is John Cockrell, the young Ohioan who has become separated from his father's regiment. We're going to hold our ground. You understand that? Ohio, you're going to stick with us. We'll get you through this today. We will be victorious, boys. We'll get you back to your family and to your unit. Atop a steep ravine, Cockerell and the others wait for an attack that is sure to come. Everything looked weird and unnatural. The leaves on the trees, though scarcely out of the bud, seemed greener than I had ever seen leaves, and larger. We 
With a suddenness, there came from all along our front a crash of musketry. Actions took the grotesque form of nightmares. The roar and din of the battle and all its terror outstripped my most fanciful dreams of pandemonium. For nearly three hours, Confederates deliver what Cockrell calls a dreadful baptism of fire. Among those killed is Frederick E. Vogler, the chipper young lieutenant who invited young Cockrell to fight with his regiment. The enemy fire became so terrible we were driven into the ravine. We kept firing as long as cartridges lasted. It was at this point our blue line wavered. Out of the ravine we survivors poured, pursued by the howling enemy. I remember my horror at the thought of being shot in the back as I retreated from the top of the bank and galloped as gracefully as I could. In this bloodbath, the 9th Illinois loses more men killed and wounded than any Union regiment in the battle. Cockerell somehow survives the slaughter and retires north amid other stragglers. While the Confederates pound the Union left and right, Another fight has been raging in an impenetrable oak thicket, choking the center of the battlefield. Confederates liken the whizzing sound of mini balls in the Union center to a swarm of angry hornets. After the battle, this dense thicket will be christened the Hornet's Nest. Here, parts of three Union divisions form a stubborn defense. Over the course of four hours, Confederate troops repeatedly storm the hornet's nest. Each time, they are driven back. Colonel Randall Lee Gibson commands a brigade of men from Louisiana and Arkansas. Four times the assault proved unavailing. The strong and almost inaccessible position of the enemy, his infantry well covered in ambush and his artillery skillfully posted and efficiently served, was found to be impregnable to infantry alone. We were repulsed. A half mile to the southeast, General Johnston rallies his brigades for yet another charge. The fight spills into the fields, orchards, and hollows of the Sarabelle farm. Private Sam Watkins of the 1st Tennessee. I had heard and read of battlefields, seen pictures of battlefields. Horses and men, cannon and wagons all jumbled together while the ground was strewn with dead and dying and wounded. But I must confess that I never realized the pomp and circumstance of the thing called glorious war until I saw this. It all seemed to me a dream. After hours of failed piecemeal assaults, Confederate leaders begin shifting every available cannon to their stalled center along the western edge of Duncan Field. Once unlimbered, the massed batteries take aim at the hornet's nest, just 300 yards away. For more than an hour, Confederate guns pound the Federal center. The 
Union troops defending the thicket are pinned down by the barrage. Meanwhile, the left and right wings of Grant's army retire to form a new defensive line extending west from Pittsburgh Landing. Among the retreating men is a jaded John Cockrell. In the crowd of fear-stricken and dejected soldiers, I met a man who belonged to my father's regiment. Inquiring of the fate of the regiment, he told me it had been entirely cut to pieces and he had personally witnessed the death of my father, seen him shot from his horse. This filled me with dismay and I determined non-combatant that I was to retire from the battlefield. For Federals in the hornet's nest, the situation is growing desperate. Both flanks of the Confederate Army press forward, tightening the noose. These converging brigades rapidly envelop the stubborn Union defenders. Some federal troops manage to slip out of the trap, but for many, there is no escape. Union General William Wallace is mortally wounded, while General Benjamin Prentiss finds himself trapped in a wooded ravine. Prentice surrenders, along with more than 2,200 Union soldiers. For the Confederates, success in the hornet's nest comes at a heavy price. Mm -hmm. Their supreme commander, Albert Sidney Johnston, is dead. Three hours earlier, Johnston collapsed while directing a charge near the peach orchard. In less than 20 minutes, he bleeds to death from an undiscovered bullet which had cut the artery behind his right knee. Albert Sidney Johnston will be the highest ranked officer killed in the Civil War. Word of his death slowly creeps among the ranks. A soldier from Louisiana remarks, a chilliness of gloom crept over our entire command. The fall of the hornet's nest marks the climactic action of a disastrous day for the Union Army. Grant hastily establishes a last line of defense stretching two miles from Dill Branch west to the heights overlooking Owl Creek. The Confederates mount one final assault, but the Union line stands firm. After 13 hours of fighting, the exhausted Confederate troops pull back to the captured Union camps. With Johnston dead, General Beauregard assumes command. Can you do it? At his headquarters near Shiloh Church, he dispatches a message to President Jefferson Davis describing a complete victory. Courier Thomas Duncan. With a seeming victory in our grasp, and with the brave, though depleted and disorganized Army of the Blue at bay at River's Brink, we saw the battle cease for the day. Many of Grant's officers await orders to retreat across the Tennessee. But where his officers see defeat, Grant sees opportunity. Not beaten yet by a dam sight, he mutters. Though bloodied, Grant's army has survived to fight another day. That night, a violent 
violent storm engulfs the Shiloh battlefield. Thunder and lightning combine with cannon fire from the Union gunboats to create a night no soldier at Shiloh will soon forget. Joseph Thompson of the 38th Tennessee. At midnight, a heavy rain set in, accompanied by peal after peal of thunder. The flashes of lightning revealed the ghastly features of the dead. The groans and piteous shrieks of the wounded were heart rendering in the extreme. Oh, what a night of horrors. It will haunt me to the grave. The next morning, Beauregard still believes all that remains is to mop up Grant's shattered forces. However, defeat is the last thing on Grant's mind. Overnight, 13,000 soldiers from Buell's army finally arrive at Pittsburgh Landing, while General Lew Wallace reinforces Grant's right with another 5,800 men. According to a soldier from Louisiana, federal troops sprouted from the ground like mushrooms. Courier Thomas Duncan. A small squad of us were preparing breakfast when firing began suddenly on the line. A wild-eyed rider proclaimed the arrival of Buell, warning us to run for our lives. April 7th is like day one, but in reverse. Buell's fresh divisions slam into the Confederate right. Grant's men hammer the left. Beauregard's stunned troops rally, fighting desperately to halt the onslaught. The continued breakdown in the Confederate chain of command only makes matters worse. On the Confederate right, Colonel John Moore commands a makeshift brigade of three regiments, which includes his own 2nd Texas Infantry. Moore is ordered to advance his brigade across Sarah Bell's field, but to hold his fire. In his front, Moore is told, is another advancing Confederate force. However, the force located before Moore's approaching men is not a Confederate force. They are soldiers from Indiana and Ohio. Even after the enemy opened fire, my officers reported the order was still given not to fire on our supposed friends. In one instance, after a private returned to fire the enemy, a staff officer drew his pistol and threatened to blow off the man's head if he fired again. The chaos Moore and his men face is experienced by many Confederates on Shiloh's second day. The fighting is every bit as fierce and bloody as the day before. The Confederates under Beauregard's leadership fight bravely. But now, outnumbered and overwhelmed, they are steadily driven back to Shiloh Church. An aide to General Beauregard is Jacob Thompson. Stragglers in great numbers came in. The complaint of exhaustion was such it was impossible to rally them. The fire and animation had left our troops. 
Shortly after 2 p.m., Beauregard issues an order unthinkable just eight hours earlier. Withdraw. Grant is still under orders to not engage the Confederates. For now, he is content to have recovered his camps lost the previous day. His most pressing question, are the defeated Confederates regrouping for another attack? Six miles south of Pittsburgh Landing, Grant receives his answer. At a place called Fallen Timbers, a Union reconnaissance triggers a skirmish with Confederate cavalry led by Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest. It is readily apparent Forrest is merely protecting the Confederate retreat. Fallen Timbers witnesses the final shots of the Battle of Shiloh. The Confederates endure a bitter march back to Mississippi.
The 70th Regiment came back after the most terrible fighting and campaigning. At its head rode my father, whom I supposed to be dead. He was pale, haggard, and worn, but unscathed. My father had not seen me nor heard from me for more than 60 hours. He took me into his arms and gave me the most affectionate embrace my life had ever known. General Grant and others hoped might signal the war's end is in fact just the beginning of a total war. Americans, North and South, free and slave, will face three more Aprils of destruction, sacrifice, and unimaginable carnage. Mm -hmm. After Shiloh, the outcome of the war remains very much in doubt. The flame shall not hurt thee. A divided nation's fiery trial has just begun. And I go 